where today we'll be looking at some history. We're going to talk about a battle that saw HMS victory in one of her most famous actions, earned Admiral Sir John Jarvis his well-deserved titles, and the gratitude of a nation, a battle that made Horatio Nelson's career. It is the Battle of Cape St. Vincent in 1797. So with lots of relaxing visuals, paper, maps, some books, and some reading, we'll look at a few of the events leading up to the battle, go over the ships in the line of battle, and read a little bit of accounts from the London Gazette, a history of the Royal Navy, and from the Naval Gazette, a bit of biography about John Jarvis. So get ready for some lovely relaxation as we enter the world of wooden ships on the high sea. In Britain, in 1797, our first news of this would be from the London Gazette. Admiralty Office, March 3rd, 1797. Robert Calder, Esquire, first captain to Admiral Sir John Jarvis, Knight of the Bath, arrived this morning with dispatches from him to Mr. Nepean, of which the following are copies. Victory in Lagos Bay, February 16th, 1797. Sir, the hopes of falling in with the Spanish fleet expressed in my letter to you of the 13th instant were confirmed that night by our distinctly hearing the report of their signal guns and by intelligence received from Captain Foote of His Majesty's ship, the Nature, who had, with equal judgment and perseverance, kept company with them for several days on my prescribed rendezvous, which, from the strong southeast winds, I had never been able to reach, and that they were not more than the distance of three or four leagues from us. I anxiously awaited the dawn of day, when, being on the starboard tack, Cape St. Vincent bearing east by north eight leagues, I had the satisfaction of seeing a number of ships, extending from the southwest to south. The wind, then, at west but and by south. At forty-nine minutes past ten, the weather being extremely hazy, La Bonne Citoyenne made the signal that the ships seen were of the line, twenty-five in number. His Majesty's squadron under my command, consisting of the fifteen ships of the line, named in the margin. Victory, Britannia, Barfleur, Prince George, Blenheim, Namur, Captain, Goliath, Excellent, Orion, Colossus, Egmont, Culloden, Irresistible, Diadem. These happily formed in the most compact order of sailing, in two lines. By carrying a press of sail, I was fortunate in getting in with the enemy's fleet at half past eleven o'clock before it had time to connect and form a regular order of battle. Such a moment was not to be lost, 
and confident in the skill, valor, and discipline of the officers and men I had, the happiness to command, and judging that the honor of His Majesty's arms and the circumstances of the war in these seas required a considerable degree of enterprise, I felt myself justified in departing from the regular system and passing through their fleet in a line formed with the utmost celerity, tacked, and thereby separated one-third from the main body. After a partial cannonade, which prevented their rejunction till evening, and by the very great exertions of the ships which had the good fortune to arrive up with the enemy on the larboard tack, the ships named in the margin, Salvador del Mundo, San Josef, San Nicolas, and San Ifredo. These were captured, and the action ceased about five o'clock in the evening. I enclosed the most correct list I have been able to obtain of the Spanish fleet opposed to me, amounting to twenty-seven sail of the line, and an account of the killed and wounded in His Majesty's ships, as well as in those taken from the enemy. The moment the latter almost totally dismasted, and His Majesty's ships, the captain and Culloden, are in a state to put to sea, I shall avail myself of the first favourable wind to proceed off Cape St. Vincent in my way to Lisbon. Captain Calder, whose able assistance has greatly contributed to the public service during my command, is bearer of this, and will more particularly describe to the Lord's Commissioners of the Admiralty the movements of the squadron on the 14th and present a state of it. I am, sir, etc. J. Jarvis. And here we have a list of killed and wounded in the squadron under the command of Admiral Sir John Jarvis in the action with the Spanish fleet the 14th of February, 1797. Victory, Admiral Sir John Jarvis, Knight of the Bath, First Captain Robert Calder, Second Captain George Gray. One seaman killed, two seamen wounded, three marines, and six total killed or wounded. Britannis, Vice Admiral Thompson, Captain Thomas Foley, one seaman wounded. Barfleur, Vice Admiral Honorable W. Waldgrave, Captain James Richard Deck, seven seamen wounded. Prince George, Rear Admiral Parker, Captain John Irwin. We have Victory, Admiral Sir John Jarvis, Knight of the Bath. Vice Admiral Thompson on Britannis, Barfleur, Vice Admiral Honorable W. Waldgrave, Prince George, Rear Admiral Parker, Blenheim, Captain Thomas Lennox, Frederick, Namur, Captain James H. Whitshed, and Captain Commodore Nelson and Captain R. W. Miller, Goliath. Excellent, Orion, Colossus, Egmont, Culloden, Irresistible, and Diadem. And we can see also some famous names. Somerez, Trowbridge, Collingwood. You can see that the Admiral's ships had very few killed and wounded. And the number in Nelson's squadron goes up because these ships saw more action down here. And here listing the officers killed and wounded on the Blenheim, Captain, Excellent, Orion, Culloden, and Irresistible. We can see that 
Commodore Nelson was bruised, but not obliged to quit the deck. And Mr. Carrington, the boatswain, wounded in boarding the San Nicola. We can see killed, killed, wounded. Someone wounded the master's mate, Mr. Joseph Wixon, then died of wounds. List of killed and wounded on board the Spanish ships taken by the squadron under the command of Admiral Sir John Jarvis, Knight of the Bath, on the 14th of February, 1797. So in addition to our list of ships captured and taken, we have the list of killed and wounded of the Spanish, and it's quite high as well. 144 on the San Nicola alone, killed. 124 wounded in Salvador del Mundo. Among the killed is the General Don Francisco Javier, and that is a Winsuf. Looks like a Dutch name. And he was the Admiral of the Squadron. And we have letters enclosed, printed by Edward Johnston in Warwick Lane. This was welcome news at home in Britain. Cape St. Vincent lies off the south coast of Portugal, at the very tip near Cadiz. You can see that it is a very beautiful coastline with high rocky cliffs and a very distinctive lighthouse for the point. And just to the east is Lagos and the Bay of Cadiz. the Atlantic, joining the Mediterranean towards Gibraltar. Over a year had passed since the Spanish allied with French forces against Great Britain. In October, 1796, the Spanish declared war on Britain and Portugal, challenging the British presence in the Mediterranean. The combined Franco-Spanish fleet of 38 ships of the line greatly outnumbered the British Mediterranean fleet of 15 ships of the line. George Spencer, the first sea lord of the Admiralty, decided that a Royal Navy presence in both the English Channel as well as in the Mediterranean was no longer viable. This forced the British to cede their positions in the western Mediterranean islands of Corsica and Elba. Admiral Sir John Jarvis would command the battleship stations at Gibraltar, blockading the Spanish fleet and denying them access to the Atlantic and to their French allies. It was a low time for Britain, with Spain intent once again on attempting invasion, a plan that might have succeeded in December 1796, had it not been for bad weather and, Hornblower fans will note, the intervention of a certain Captain Edward Pellew, Jarvis, seeing the importance of a British victory to the public at home and the Royal Naval position in the Mediterranean and on the high seas, began to conceive a plan. The Spanish fleet at Cartagena, on the Mediterranean side, 
was to join the French fleet at Brest. Admiral Don José de Cordova, having formed a force of 23 ships of the line to escort a convoy of Spanish merchant ships from the Americas, intended to sail to Cadiz. Horatio Nelson had sighted them, and Jarvis immediately weighed anchor to bear down on the enemy. The Spanish fleet left Cartagena on 1st February, but the Levanter, a strong easterly wind blowing between Gibraltar and Cadiz, pushed the Spanish fleet out into the Atlantic. When the winds died down, the Spanish fleet started to beat back to Cadiz. Beating means that they had to go into the wind, which means they're covering more distance by tacking back and forth, back and forth, not a favorable position to be in. The British Mediterranean fleet under Jarvis had sailed from the river Tagus with ten ships of the line to intercept them. On 6th February, Jarvis was joined off Cape St. Vincent with a reinforcement of five ships of the line from the Channel Fleet under Rear Admiral William Parker. On 11th of February, the British frigate HMS Minerve, under the command of Commodore Horatio Nelson, passed through the Spanish fleet unseen thanks to heavy fog. Nelson reached the British fleet of 15 ships off Spain on the 13th of February and passed the location of the Spanish fleet to Jarvis, commanding the fleet from his flagship, Victory. Unaware of the size of the Spanish fleet because of the fog, Nelson had not been able to count them. Jarvis's squadron immediately sailed to intercept, while the Spanish, unaware of the British presence, continued toward Cadiz. As we continue to prepare our little paper ships for a line of battle, let's look at the Naval Chronicle. I've got this bit from the Naval Gazette. You can see it's printed out from a digital copy. So not very perfect printing, but also on the book from which the digital copy was made. You could see some foxing on the pages, but I think it's come out quite well. The French armament lay ready for sea in as good a state of equipment as the resources possessed by the enemy could put it. The inattention of a few hours might enable this foe, rendered almost desperate by calamity, to escape from the state of durance in which he was held and effect considerable mischief on some vulnerable territory belonging to the Allies and friends of Britain, before sufficient discovery could be made of his route to render pursuit politic or effectual. The unremitting attention of Sir John operated very successfully to the prevention of any such disaster, and the British commerce was consequently extended over the face of the whole Mediterranean without experiencing any other substantial interruption. The French Directory having, by insinuations, by threats, and other artifices of terror or persuasion, contrived, towards the end of the year 1796, to detach the court of Spain from the alliance of Great Britain. The situation of the fleet in that quarter under the orders of Sir John, was suddenly rendered extremely critical. 
though the state of the Toulon squadron was insufficient to create any disquiet in his mind, yet the fleet at Cadiz alone, in the most perfect condition for service, more than doubled the force he commanded. The political situation of his country at that time rendered the greatest exertions necessary. A formidable combination was raised against her, and the fleets of her opponents, Holland, France, and Spain, had they all been permitted to unite, would have composed an immense armament consisting of nearly one hundred ships of the line. The internal commotions, which had for some time pervaded Ireland, appeared to afford these confederated foes the greatest hopes of success, provided it were possible for them to put on shore and body of regular troops sufficiently numerous to countenance the rebellious insurgents in their open avowal of that treason which, owing to the insidious representations of those among their own countrymen who possessed most influence and were considered as the leaders of their party, had long been cherished in their bosoms. At this period it had attained a height truly formidable and alarming. An attempt was made by France, immediately after Spain had become an ally to the cause of republicanism, to carry this project into execution, and though it had completely failed, there was little reason to expect that the want of success on that occasion would go so far, intimidate the enemy, as to prevent a repetition of it. Regarding, therefore, the general posture of public affairs, it must appear evident that very urgent necessity peremptorily demanded the immediate execution of some grand and decisive measure which might by its consequential success, contribute to dispel that tremendous cloud which appeared on the point of bursting over her. Of this situation, together with all the circumstances which led to it, Sir John was perfectly well acquainted, but very little relief could be expected. Highly as the abilities of its commander might be esteemed, from a squadron consisting of twenty-six ships of the line and ten frigates, which, putting the French force at Toulon totally out of the question, had to contend with an enemy of three times its own force. This disparity of numbers was in some degree reduced by the arrival of Rear Admiral Parker from England, who formed a junction with Sir John on the 6th of February. Still, however, his force was so very unequal to that of the enemy that nothing but the existing case could have warranted the attack, nor anything short of the greatest exertions in regard to Pussy. In addition to Sir John's report, we also have a few other reports here. I mentioned. When the Spanish reconnoitering vessels were distinctly perceived, several British ships were immediately ordered to chase, so that, on the appearance of the enemy's van, it became necessary to form the line ahead and astern of the Admiral as most convenient without respect to the other order of battle. This was done by signal at five minutes past eleven. The signal to cut through the enemy's line was made by the Admiral at thirty-five minutes past eleven, and this was immediately followed by that to engage. These signals were obeyed with equal ardour and celerity by Captain Trowbridge in the Culloden followed by the Blenheim, Prince George, and other ships as they formed. The moment the enemy's line was broken, all the ships to the windward, war, 
so to wear a ship is to turn around almost a hundred degrees. Some in succession, others two or three together, as their fears or necessity compelled them. The signal was then given for the British fleet to tack in succession. This was immediately done by the greater part of the line. But the captain, bearing the broad pennant of Commodore Nelson, being in the rear, wore ship and pushed on with a view to support the Culloden and prevent the seventeen Spanish ships already cut off from rejoining their van. This maneuver completely succeeded. He was soon followed by the excellent, and presently after by the diadem and Namur. At one o'clock, the Britannia's signal was made to tack, the headmost of the British ships having so much damaged the Spanish van that it began to move off, and the principal force becoming in consequence necessary for the succour of the captain and the Culloden with the other ships that were then commencing their attack upon the enemy. On the Britannia's putting her helm a lee, the Barfleur instantly warship, and, as being a faster sailor, soon reached within a cable's length of the victory, directly in her wake, which station she maintained till the end of the action, about a quarter of an hour's interval, excepted when the Namur, from her swift sailing, was enabled to push between her and the victory. The Spanish ships, being thus cut off and prevented from rejunction during the battle by the quick and well-directed fire of the Prince George, the Culloden, Blenheim, Orion, Irresistible, and Diadem. The rest of the British squadron fought with the others and, before sunset, took possession of Salvador del Mundo and San Josef, or Josef. 112 guns. The San Nicolas of 84 guns and the San Isidro of 74 guns. The Santissima Trinidad, the Spanish flagship, escaping with considerable difficulty and in the most shattered condition. At this period, nine or ten of the Spanish ships that had been separated and therefore unengaged during the whole contest, having at length effected a junction with their van, were preparing to come down and renew the action. It was now that the great merit of Sir John Jarvis displayed itself to advantage. With the most prompt resolution, he brought to, and made so able a disposition for the defense of the ships under his care that, though still superior in number, they thought proper to leave their friends and avoid the danger with which they were threatened. The consequences of this victory were as happy as the circumstances which attended it were glorious. The British fleet, though for a long time inferior in numbers as well as force, exhibited the singular and wonderful spectacle to the rest of the world of the power it possessed in being capable of confining a fleet stronger than itself within the harbour of the principal port belonging to Spain, and insulting that port itself by every act an enemy elated with victory could devise. The joy with which the news of this success was received in England was in no degree inferior to the magnitude and consequence of it nor did the public gratitude keep an unequal pace with the general exultation. Sir John received from his sovereign, exclusive of other inferior honours, the more consequential elevation to the dignity of a baron and earl of Great Britain by the titles of Baron Jarvis and Earl of St. Vincent, the scene of his glory. The history of the Royal Navy, of which we've got uh, a part.
about here about the Battle of Cape St. Vincent has a much more detailed and minute by minute account almost of this battle. We won't go through that because I think find it a bit tedious on a video like this. Um, suffice it to say that this was a momentous battle. Um, and there are some historians now who um, don't think that it was that surprising that uh, Britain won. But at the time, as we can see by the accounts that we've read contemporaneous to the battle, it um, might have been a close run thing and was a very significant victory for the British fleet. And not the least of which were the tactics of Jarvis in forming his line. So what we'll do is have a look at some of these lines of battle at three different times during the battle as the ships are drawn up and as these are drawn up in the history of the Royal Navy here. And see how that goes, how that matches up with what we've read from our accounts. Early on the 14th, Jarvis learnt that the Spanish fleet was 35 miles to windward. During the night, came sounds that the British fleet had been wanting to hear, the signal guns of the Spanish ships in the fog. Jarvis gave the order to form a line of battle ahead and astern of victory. When this order was completed, the British fleet had formed a single line of battle, sailing in a southerly direction, in a course to pass between the two Spanish columns. To the British advantage, the Spanish fleet was formed into two groups, thus unprepared for battle, while the British were already in line. Jarvis ordered the British fleet to pass between the two groups, while Culloden, Blenheim, and then Prince George tacked in succession to come up on the Spanish fleet from behind. The Spanish Lee Division now put about to the port tack with the intention of breaking the British line at the point where the ships were tacking in succession. As the last ship in the British line passed the Spanish, the British line had formed a U-shape with Culloden in lead and on the reverse course but chasing the rear of the Spanish. At this point, the Spanish Lee Division bore up to make an effort to join their compatriots to windward. Commodore Horatio Nelson of the captain of 74-gun ship of the line distinguished himself rather well in this battle, showing his prowess in action and decision-making and his bold daring in interpreting orders, capturing two enemy ships. It was a great and welcome victory for the Royal Navy and for Britain. Fifteen British ships had defeated a Spanish fleet of twenty-seven. At 11.31 a.m., when the Culloden was abreast of the leading ships of the enemy's weather division, she opened fire upon them by signal and was replied to. Though the range was distant. So we have two sides of the wind, as it were. Upwind is the weather side and downwind is the lee side. So when they talk about weather and lee divisions, that's what they're referring to. 
the ships that were on the weather side had advantage over those that were downwind. The ships in the wake of the Culloden followed her example as they approached within gunshot and at 12.08 p.m., just as Trowbridge had passed the last ship of the Spanish Weather Division, he was signaled to tack. The Blenheim did the same a little later, and then the Prince George. At about that time, the Spanish Lee Division put about on the port tack, as if with the intention of cutting the British column at the point at which the vessels composing it were tacking in succession. The Orion got round. The Colossus, her next astern, was in the act of going about when her foreyard and foretopsail yard were shot away in the slings, and her foretopmast went a little above the cap. She had in consequence to wear instead of tack. So a square rigged ship and turn around the other direction, in which case it goes around quite a bit. It was about 1 p.m. when the excellent, the rearmost ship of the British line had advanced so far ahead on her course in the starboard tack as to leave an open sea to leeward of the Spanish Weather Division and when the leading ships of the latter bore up together by way of making an effort to join their friends to leeward. This was the critical moment of the action which, up to that time, had been of a very partial character, and which, had the Spaniards been allowed unchecked to accomplish their purpose, would no doubt either have ended indecisively, almost at once, or have become a long and tedious running fight. Nelson, in the captain, quickly perceived this, and realized that the head of the doubled-up British column pursuing the main body of the Spaniards was too far astern of it to be able to interfere unaided with success, giving, therefore, a very wide interpretation of a signal to which had been hoisted by the victory at 12.51 p.m., the Commodore ordered Captain Miller to wear the captain. As soon as the two-decker was round, he took her between the diadem and the excellent, and ran her off with the bows of the Spanish ships forming the central mass of the weather division. This mass included the Santissima Trinidad, 130 guns, San Jose, 112, Salvador del Mundo, 112, San Nicolas, 80, San Isidro, 74, and another three-decker, which is supposed to have been the Mexicano, 112. There is no doubt that Nelson believed that the surrender of the San Josef was brought about chiefly, if not entirely, by the fact that he boarded her from the San Nicolas. But it is practically certain that the immediate cause of the surrender, both of the San Nicolas and the San Josef, was the heavy fire to which, at the time, they were being treated by the Prince George and which was not indeed suspended until the captain hailed Parker's flagship to say that the Spaniards had struck. Yet even if such be truth, it detracts nothing from Nelson's dash and gallantry. He boarded, supposing on each occasion that he was boarding a still unbeaten foe.
At about 1.30 p.m., when the Culloden, which had gradually overhauled the Spanish rear, had for ten minutes sustained a renewed but as yet not very close engagement with this same group of ships, the captain opened fire upon her gigantic opponents. Yet before Jarvis at 1.19 p.m. had signaled to his rearmost ship, the Excellent, to come to the wind on the larboard tack and in compliance. Collingwood had hauled sharp up, so that by 2.15 p.m. he had reached a station ahead of the leading weather portion of the British line, the Blenheim and Prince George being then well up behind the Culloden, and there being thus five British ships in a position the bar to bar the way, the Spanish plan was effectively frustrated. The account of the extraordinary feat which followed may be given in Nelson's own words. He called for boarders and ordered them to board the San Nicolas, on the port side of which lay the San Jose, still foul of her consort. So, my friend, is life in the Royal Navy at sea in the year 1797? I hope this has been relaxing for you, and that it's also been a little informative that you've enjoyed the story, and this time in a study with me. Be good to yourself, be kind to others, and as John Jarvis and Horatio Nelson, be extraordinary.